let g be a complex valued function. So that means it sends some element in an interval of the real numbers to a complex number. And for simplicity's sake, let's suppose it's real and imaginary parts. Remember, we can write g of t. We can write g of t is equal to u of t plus i v of t. So let's assume that it's real and imaginary parts are integrable. And in this video, we're going to show the triangle inequality for complex valued functions for integrals. <laughs> so we're going to show, that is, we're going to show that the modulus of the integral from a to b of g of t dt is less than or equal to the integral from a to b of the modulus of g of t dt. So to prove this, we're going to need two lemmas. Our first lemma Lemma 1 says the following. It tells us that the real part of a complex number z, so let me say let z, let z be in the complex numbers. It tells us that the real part of a complex number z is less than or equal to the modulus of that complex number. So let's prove it. So if z is in the complex numbers, so that means that z is equal to x plus iy for some x and y in the real numbers. So the real part of z is equal to x, which is less than or equal to the square root of x squared. And the reason why this is true is the square root of x squared is asking for what number, when squared, gives us x squared. So there's two numbers, when squared, that gives us x squared. It's exactly negative x squared is equal to x squared. And positive x squared is equal to x squared. So when x is negative, this inequality is a strict inequality. And when x is non-negative, so when x is zero or positive, this this equality, this rather this inequality is an equality. So check this out. Since x squared is less than or equal to x squared plus y squared, and since the square root function is increasing, increasing on its domain increasing on its domain. This means that the square root of x squared is less than or equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. Remember, if I have an increasing function, if f is increasing and x is less than or equal to y, then that implies that f of x is less than or equal to f of y. And this is exactly the case for the square root function. And look at this, the square root of x squared plus y squared, this is equal to just the modulus of z. And we're done. We're done. The next lemma, lemma two, lemma two says the following. Lemma two says that the real part of the integral of a from a to b of g of t, of our function g of t that we defined above, dt, is equal to the integral from a to b of the real part of g of t. So let's prove why this is true. Let's prove why this is true. So recall that g of t, g of t is equal to u of t plus i v of t, since it's a complex valued function. So it sends some numbers on some interval, or it sends numbers on some interval of the real numbers to complex numbers. So we define, we define the integral of a complex valued function that sends real numbers on some interval to complex numbers in the following way. So the integral from a to b of g of t dt this is defined to be, it's defined to be the integral of the real part with respect to t from a to b plus i times the integral of the imaginary part with respect to t. So it's a very natural definition. So check this out, check this out. The real part of this integral, of the real part of the integral from a to b of g of t dt is exactly, this is exactly the integral from a to b of u of t. And u of t is the real part of g of t. So this is equal to the integral from a to b of the real part of g of t. So we're done, dt, rather. <laughs> so now we're finally ready to prove our main result. So let's do it. 
So to prove this, we're just going to start bounding this guy above. And I encourage you to try it out on your own and try seeing what happens when we try to bound this guy above and sort of what comes out of it. Before we start bounding this value from above, let's notice the following fact. The integral from a to b of g of t dt is just a complex number. And to see why this is true, notice that these two guys, the real part and the imaginary part of g of t, are just real valued functions. That is, u of t and v of t are real numbers for any t. So this means, based off of how this integral is defined, remember that this integral is defined to be the integral from a to b of v of t dt, which is going to be a real number, plus i times the integral from a to b of v of t dt, which is also another real number, times i. And this, of course, is just a, a complex number. And let's write this complex number in its polar form. R, the modulus of that complex number, times e to the i theta, where theta is the argument of that complex number. So this is going to be helpful to recognize these facts here. Okay. So, based off of what we just said, the modulus of the integral from a to b of g of t dt, this is equal to the modulus of our complex number z, and the modulus of our complex number z is r. This is just equal to r. Well, what is r? Well, if you were to solve for r in this equation, notice, notice, that if we were to solve for r, remember r e to the i theta, we're saying that, that this is equal to the integral from a to b of g of t dt. Because the integral from a to b of g of t dt is just a complex number, and we're saying that that complex number is some, some r times e to the i theta. It's a complex number written in this polar form. So, let's solve for r here. If we solve for r, we're going to get that r is equal to e to the negative i theta times the integral from a to b of g of t dt. And let's just bring this guy in because e to the negative i theta is not dependent on t. So we can bring it into the integral. It's a constant with respect to t. So this is equal to the integral from a to b of e to the negative i theta g of t dt. And notice, notice that this is still, this whole function, this the product of these two guys, is still a complex valued function that sends numbers from a to b, which is a interval, a closed interval on the real number line, to the complex numbers. So this is still, this is still some function, I'm going to call this function, I'm going to call this function h of t, all right? I'm going to call this function h of t. So this, this is equal to some function, the integral from a to b of h of t, some function h of t, which is just this guy, it's still a real valued function, oh sorry, it's still a complex valued function, and I'm going to call in this complex valued function h of t. Okay. So now, one thing to note here is since r, r is the modulus of a complex number, so it's a, it's a real number, r is in the real numbers. So that means the modulus of r is equal to r, right? And also the real part of r is equal to r. So check this out. Since the real part of r is equal to r, then that means that r is equal to its real part. And since r is equal to this guy, this means that the real part of r is equal to the real part of the integral from a to b of h of t dt. Well, this is the same based off of our lemma 2. Based off of our lemma 2, we can sort of bring this real part inside the integral. So this is the same as the integral from a to b of the real part of h of t dt. Now, notice that the real part of h of t dt, or there's rather, sorry, this real part of h of t, this is just a good old-fashioned real number. So that means this integral is just a good old-fashioned integral of real numbers from single variable calculus. So we can use monotonicity. And why am I bringing this up? Well, remember our lemma one. The real part 
the real part of a complex number. So h of t is a complex number for any t. The real part of a complex number is less than or equal to the modulus of that complex number. So what's the real part of h of t? Well, h of t, h of t is e to the negative i theta times g of t. So the real part of e to the negative i theta times g of t is less than or equal to the modulus of this guy, e to the negative i theta times g of t. Well, what's the modulus of this guy? Well, let's use the fact that the modulus of the product of two complex numbers, z, z prime, is equal to the product of the individual moduli. So the product of z times z prime, sorry, the modulus of z times z prime is equal to the modulus of z times the modulus of z prime. So this guy is equal to, this, this right-hand side right here, is equal to the modulus of e to the negative i theta times the modulus of g of t. Well, what's the modulus of e to the negative i theta? Well, let's, let's remember, e to the negative i theta is equal to, based off of how the complex exponential is defined, cosine of negative theta plus i sine of negative theta. So if we want to take the modulus of e to the negative i theta, we just square the real and imaginary parts. We square the real and imaginary parts and take the square root. But cosine squared of anything plus sine squared of that same thing that we're taking the cosine squared of is equal to 1 by the, the Pythagorean identity. So this is equal to 1. So look at this. This is just equal to g of t, or rather the modulus of g of t. So what we're saying, what we're saying is the real part of h of t is less than or equal to the modulus of g of t. And if you remember, remember from single variable calculus, check this out. If I have f of x is less than or equal to g of x for x on some interval from a to b, then this implies, this implies that the integral from a to b of f of x is less than dx, is less than or equal to the integral from a to b of g of x dx. And this is exactly what we have here. This is exactly what we have here. We have that the real part of h of t is less than or equal to, is less than or equal to the modulus of g of t for all elements t, for all values t on the interval from a to b. So this means that this guy, this guy is less than or equal to, look at this, the integral from a to b of the modulus of g of t dt. And we're done by the monotonicity, right? By the way, this, this, just to emphasize, this inequality follows from the monotonicity of integration that you learn about in single variable calculus. This fact right here.